Hello there! My name is Brandon and I make pictures out of tiny squares and post them online for fun. And if you're interested in pixel art, you probably heard of the term 8-bit before. Well, there's also something called 1-bit, and it's essentially a fancy way of saying black and white pixel art. And it's actually one of my favorite styles to work within, so this week I thought I'd share a few 1-bit techniques, and then I also have a time lapse of a new 1-bit piece that I've been working on to share as well. So without further ado, let's play with some bits. That doesn't sound right. So as I mentioned, the term 1-bit is just kind of a fancy way to refer to black and white pixel art, but it doesn't strictly have to. What it really means is that you're only using two colors. Most often this is defaulted to black and white, but it could also be green and black, pink and green, or red and blue for example. I mean, those other ones can be kind of harsh on the eyes, so I think sticking to black and white is a safe bet and it's a classic look. I like to give a bit of character to mine, so I tend to add a touch of purple into the black tone, and I'll add a touch of green into the white tone. What I like is that it looks black and white at first glance, but it actually has a really subtle color temperature going on. It's also just kind of a fun way to bring some of your own preferences into something as simple an idea as black and white. So what's so great about making pixel art in one bit? Well, in pixel art it's often useful to set up some kind of restriction on the color palette. It often goes hand in hand with just the idea of working in low display resolutions in general, or trying to capture a particular look from a classic console. Of course, in modern digital art, we essentially have an infinite number of color choices available right within our program of choice, so we don't necessarily need to stay within a low color count if we don't want to. However, for any digital artist, it can be intimidating to look at that infinite array of color and know how to select even a handful of those to use. A 1-bit color palette strips all of that away and leaves you with an entirely contrast-based palette. It's a really fun way to approach pixel art because it forces you to focus on the essentials of constructing artwork, things like form, space, and texture. Now, of course, the exact style will be up to your own preferences, but there's a few general techniques that you can keep in your back pocket when making a one-bit piece. So we know we'll be working with only two shades, black and white. But we can actually strategically blend them to create even more shades. For example, if we made a perfect checkerboard pattern of alternating black and white pixels, we'll end up with something that approximates a 50% gray shade. This is very much like the halftone technique used in printing presses, like if you think about a black and white newspaper, they only print black ink on the paper, and it can be spaced out in different sized dots to create various shades of grey. In pixel art, this technique is referred to as dithering, and we can use it to create a makeshift gradient of our 1-bit colors. So we've got the full black, the full white, and the 50% grey, but we can use dithering to keep this idea going and smooth all the tones together as a continuous gradient from black to white. And look at how those dithered areas become kind of a cool pattern to look at. Some people take this idea and go a step further by mixing in other shapes and create very unique dithering effects. Just as my own personal preference, I don't usually work gradients into my artwork all that much. I tend to stick to the regular tones, so if I'm doing one bit work, I keep things restricted to the pure black or pure white along with a 50% gray if it's necessary. We can also work in pattern and texture to achieve even more within a one bit style. Again, this comes down to the style and subject matter of the art itself, like I like making mechanical or sci-fi type stuff, so working in repetition of straight or angled stripes can help build up those mechanical components, as they tend to have that sort of regularity to them. And a few well-placed dots or dashes can really give some visual diversity to a city skyline. You could extend this idea into other kinds of patterns, like uh, grids, polka dots, or any other shapes you feel like for whatever purpose you need. Another thing to consider is the use of line and line weight within one bit work. Like not every line has to be one pixel thick, you could double or triple up some of the lines to give some extra visual weight to a certain element. Like in this piece, the main line of the sidewalk is an extra pixel thick, and I think it just helps give a bit more grounding. You can also make the choice whether or not to have adjacent objects touching or overlapping. Like this air conditioning unit sitting in front of the wall with a pipe coming out of it. If you look closely, the white pixels that define each of these objects actually never intersect. I think it just helps give them a bit more individual clarity. Again, that's another stylistic choice. You could decide to have the white pixels of these objects washing into one another. I guess the important thing is that you set up that logic and carry it through the entire piece consistently. And finally, I just wanted to quickly distinguish two obvious options when you're working within one bit. Usually I'll open up a canvas and then fill the background with either all white or all black, and then use the other color on a separate layer to do my line work. They're inverse styles, but the approach can be slightly different. Like with white on black, everything is by default in shadow, and it's your job to paint in the light. With the black on white approach, this is the exact opposite. Things will default to being light, and it's your job to paint in the shadows. So it's just something to think about depending how you like to approach a piece. 
if it makes more sense to you to be painting in light details or makes more sense to you to be painting in shadows. All right, so hopefully we're all up to speed on a few different one-bit approaches. So let's hop over to the time-lapse of a new one-bit piece that I've been working on this week. So to start this piece, I opened up a canvas that was 200 by 200 pixels. The first thing I did was drop in the black background and then sized out a white border that just left an area of 160 by 144 to work with. That's the resolution of the Nintendo Game Boy, and I've been having a lot of fun working in that size lately. I, I like the challenge of not having a ton of room to work with, and you kind of have to find creative ways to make effective use of that space. The only things I had in mind coming to this piece is that I wanted it to be a game mock-up, like something that looked like a screenshot from a real game. Uh, I wanted there to be a HUD bar along the top, kind of like how the HUD looks in Super Metroid, where there's lots of information like item icons and map and things like that. And I also wanted there to be a player portrait where it was half human and half robot, like divided down the center. Like maybe the player's a cyborg or something, like he looks human but he's robot underneath. Aside from those things, I didn't really know what this game was going to be, so I just kept designing the HUD until I got more ideas that made it more clear. I thought that because he's a cyborg, it'd be fun to give him like a classic life bar that had hearts, but then also have a second life bar where it was more of like an energy level that was a battery. And I filled out the opposite side of the HUD with a bunch of squares that are intended to be kind of like a room map. And I realized that above the map I could fit sort of a small string of letters if I wanted to, so I ended up calling it the Cryo Lab since that sounds very sci-fi, and also it doesn't take up a lot of room. And also it gave me a direction to go because I knew that I could start drawing some kind of lab setting once I got into that part of the artwork. I finished out the middle of the HUD with an item inventory. I think each icon ends up being about 9x9 nine nine pixels or so, so like not really a ton of room to work with, but I popped in a few icons just to get the point across. So there's like a floppy disk, uh, there's a capsule there, and then there's a Wi-Fi thing, so he's got Wi-Fi in his inventory, so that's cool for while he's chilling in the cryo lab, right? When I was fine-tuning the portrait, I realized that the style of the portrait wasn't exactly what I was picturing in my head before I started this piece. And also this might mostly be because I gave him that little hair swoosh by accident, but he kind of reminded me of Tintin, you know, the little boy detective with the dog and all that. And I thought that was kind of funny, so I just actually decided to lean into that and made him, I just made him a detective who's investigating this cryo lab for some reason. When I popped down to the main area to design a sprite, I kept it fairly small and just tried to put him in a sort of investigation type of pose, whatever that means. I guess like sort of braced for investigating. I don't know. Like he's just uncovered something unsettling that also cracked this case wide open, you know, going off that detective angle I just made up two seconds ago. From head to toe, I think he's only about 20 pixels tall. And I was zoomed in most of the time when I was making him. So by the time I zoomed out, I was like, oh, wow, I still have tons of room to work with. Which is great, because it meant that I had a lot of space to make all those cryolab details around and, and really make the space shine as well. For the cryolab, I decided the best way to approach it was just to design like a main showpiece thing, something that's going to draw most of the focus first, and then have everything fall into place around that after. I drew a kind of rounded glass canister type of thing, you know, to house some sort of experimental thing or like a creature laying dormant in the lab. I started by roughing out a humanoid type design. By the way, at this low resolution, it's kind of hard to do a round head and not have them end up looking like a Lego character, you know, where they have kind of like the protruding piece on top of their head. I think that's just an artifact of like kind of doing a small circle look, right? I moved through some vaguely monstery designs, but it didn't really feel too mysterious. There was nothing super readable from the design, so I kept trying different combinations and eventually end up coming up with this design with wings, which I thought looked very cool and striking and seemed to be a bit more worthy of this detective boy sort of being startled by what he was seeing. I filled out the bottom area with some equipment that's hooked up to the canister, so there's like a small computer, and then on the other side I made a sort of lab bench with some glassware, just to show some monitoring or experiments that were going on, but now the place is like mysteriously deserted, you know? For the rest of the lab, I mapped out a lot of pipes and short dashes for texture and added lots of things along the ceiling using different sizes and combos of squares and other shapes. I tried to keep everything in a theme of metal pipes, cylinders, canisters, and things like that just to convey different systems required for cooling and also whatever experiments are going on there. I also thought it'd be cool to have some smoke around the creature's container to have some kind of a nebulous thing amongst all these rigid pipes and things. Making cloud and gas sort of effects is still something I'd like to work on, but my typical method usually just involves dropping down a bunch of different sized circles and then going in and either joining them together or adding tails to the ends just to show some sort of dispersion or direction to them. Alright, so this is getting towards the end of the time lapse, so I think we'll fade out here and then kind of do like a mysterious reveal of the final piece of our game mock-up of our new game, uh, Super Cyborg Detective Boy Investigates Cryolab. Is that a good name for a game? I don't know. 
I'll think of something though. All right, let's take a look. All in all, I think this turned out pretty cool. I mean, if it were a real playable game, it might be hard to keep track of things in one bit like this, uh, since it's fairly busy, but I think it's a fun concept piece anyway. I finished off the rest of the lab area with different kinds of shapes and mechanical things, like there's the triangular fan blades, there's a bunch of cylinders and pipes along the top, and then there's some loose wires kind of draping around everything else. I also usually try to find somewhere to fit in like angled sort of caution hazard tape, so I put that along the bottom uh, of the detail of the floor tiling. And I played with the smoke some more to make sure it framed the demon-y character nicely. I tried this thing where the smoke goes behind a pipe on one side and in front of the pipe on the other side, but you can still see the texture of the pipe kind of showing through. That's the kind of stuff that I find fun to troubleshoot and solve within one bit work. <laughs> Sorry, look at me here talking about the pipes. Hey, cool piece, man. That's a nice demon. Yeah, 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 sure. But check out these pipes, though. Look at what I do with the smoke. Anyway, because of how busy things ended up getting towards the ceiling, I feel like the division between the game area and the HUD got lost a little bit. So I separated those areas into two distinct bordered boxes, and I think it helps like give a bit more clarity to each one individually. And I did still keep those areas within the original designated 160 by 144 space though, so I was really happy about that. All right, that's all I got for now. Thank you for watching. Um, also, feel free to let me know what you thought about the format of this video. I like the idea of doing like a tutorial before jumping into the time lapse. Help maybe appreciate some of the things that were going on in the time lapse. So if that worked out, let me know. Um, also, I hope this has maybe convinced you to try out one bit pixel art for yourself if you haven't before. It's a really fun way to work. Um, so thanks again for watching. Take care and keep it square.